Welcome to session three of the Spiritual Growth Retreat for uh, West Virginia ABW. Um, we're going to continue with our theme of trash to treasure. And you know, they say that one woman's trash is another woman's treasure. And that's why some of you love going to yard sales so much, because you never know what sort of treasures you're going to find when you're digging through stuff that somebody else is getting rid of. And I bought, brought some things this morning that um, may look like trash to some of you, um, but to me, uh, they're treasures because of the story behind them. And I want to share some of them with you. First, I have this lovely sign, and I don't know if it turns out the correct direction <laughs> for you to read it, um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's just a board uh, that's been painted and, and painted a little mess messy, and, uh, the, you know, the letters aren't straight, anything like that. Some people might think that's trash, but to me, this is a treasure because my son uh, painted this for me when he was little to let me know that I was doing a good job. So that's treasure. Um, I also have this. Now, this doll is a little bit beat up. I mean, she's got some holes in her neck and her legs are dirty and uh, she's, she's uh, faded a little bit. Um, but she is a treasure because this was made by my uh, great aunt Viola, who was a missionary to the Congo back during World War II. And she made this doll especially for me when I was little. So it's a treasure. And then this, I'm not sure if you can see it, um, it's just a little bracelet made out of grass and it's dried and it's um, disconnected um, it's just a piece of grass. That seems like that would just be something to throw away. But to me, this is a treasure. Because when I was in fifth grade, my friend Debbie made this for me. Um, and she said that this was uh, a friendship bracelet. Sign that we would be friends forever. And we have been. Um, so, you know, sometimes... Uh, you think that something is a piece of trash because you don't know the story behind it. Um, you know, to some people, antiques are just old junk. And to others, they're a valuable part of history because they understand their purpose and their history. To some people, uh, collectible cards are just pieces of cardboard and, you know, they should, you know, just be thrown away. But to others, those are an important investment um, some people collect them because they're reminders of their childhood. Um, some people look at an old car and just see scrap metal, while somebody else, a car buff, will look at that and will see a rare classic. And some people look at an old house and just see an eyesore that needs to be torn down. But somebody who has some knowledge of architecture will look at that and say, oh, that's a beautiful historical example uh, that needs to be preserved and taken care of. How we look at things determines how we value them. Uh, when we know the story behind them, when we uh, see a beautiful future for them, then we can value them as treasure rather than looking at them as trash. Um, most people look at a, a ceiling fan blade from a broken ceiling fan or they look at a, a pallet or a broken teacup and they see trash. But those of you who are very crafty and good at upcycling, look at that and you see something that can become a treasure. You see the beauty that could be there. And you know, it's the same way with people as it is with objects. Some people look at others and see only their flaws, their mistakes, their poor choices. Others look at them and they see the child that they used to be, or they see the good future they could have if they could just get past that mistake, if they could just make a couple of right choices. 
you know, this has been a growing edge for me. When I was a younger Christian, I looked at people and I saw the flaws. And I would be judgmental about people based on their flaws. But God has been teaching me to look at people differently, to reserve judgment until I've looked at the whole picture. And I'm still aware that the flaws are there, but I'm also looking for the good in people because, you know, we're all a mixture of flaws and virtues. And I can look at somebody and say, well, she has a bit of a potty mouth, but man, does she have a heart of compassion for the underdog, for the underprivileged, for the child that is struggling. I can look at somebody else and say, well, she is a bit obnoxious, but man, is she really good at her job and she has a great skill set. And I've spent a lot of years trying to learn to see people the way that God sees them. Because when God looks at people, he doesn't see trash. He sees all of it. He sees the flaws. He sees the virtues. He sees those things that we have hidden from everybody else. And God doesn't look at people the same way that we look at each other. Um, in the Bible, in 1 Samuel 7, we read the story of the prophet Samuel, uh, who is sent by God to the family of Jesse to anoint a new king over Israel. And Samuel gets there and he takes one look at uh, Jesse's son, who is tall and good looking and looks like a king. And he thinks, oh, this must be the one. And he's ready to anoint him simply because of how he looks. But God tells Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. As Jesus went through Israel, uh, he looked at the heart rather than the outward appearance. Look at the people that he had compassion on in the New Testament compared with the people that he criticized. Um, when he met up with scribes, Pharisees, priests, and Sadducees, um, the very religious people, uh, people who had very similar theologies to Jesus, uh, you would think that he would get along really well with the religious people, wouldn't you? But Jesus knew their hearts. And often those are the people that Jesus was harsh with because he knew that they were full of their own self-righteousness. Um, he tells the story of a, a Pharisee that went in to pray and says, said, Oh God, I am so thankful that I'm not like that person. And that I do all the, the little rules. I give a tenth of everything I have. He knew that some of them were more concerned about their wealth and their position than really following God. He saw some of them that were trying to trap him and discredit him because he didn't fit in with their ideas of a religious teacher and they were unwilling to think that they might be wrong. And they were proud of following their own religious rules while they ignored some of the rules that God had given them. And so Jesus called them on their religious hypocrisy. Um, he said, you know, he told people, uh, you must be careful to do everything these religious leaders tell you, but don't do what they do. For they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Everything they done is for people to... Everything they do is done for people to see. They make their phylacteries wide and the tassels on their garments long. They love the place of honor at banquets and the most important seats in the synagogues. The Pharisees didn't live out what they believed, and they got called on it by Jesus. But on the other hand, Jesus had some very kind words for people that the rest of society thought were inappropriate people, people that they looked down on. 
Jesus ate with tax collectors, people who uh, got rich by cheating others when they collected the taxes. He ate with prostitutes and with sinners. He touched lepers who no one else would touch. He saw a poor widow who only put two coins, two small coins, in the offering. And he praised her and said she's put in more than everybody else. Because Jesus knew her heart. And Jesus knew what she had. He wasn't looking at the surface. When people came to Jesus for physical healing, um, oftentimes he would forgive their sins first because he knew their heart. He knew that what they really needed was to be forgiven because that was their deepest hunger. Jesus looked at their hearts. He didn't see trash. He saw treasure. He saw their hunger for healing. He saw their need. He saw their value. Gospel of Matthew tells us that when Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus ate with Zacchaeus, the tax collector, and people grumbled because he was eating with this tax collector instead of an upstanding citizen. And sure enough, at the end of the evening, Zacchaeus said, if I have cheated anybody, I will pay them back double what I have cheated them of. Because Jesus knew that there was uh, something in Zacchaeus that was ready to repent and do the right thing. Most Jewish men ignored Samaritans and women they weren't related to. Uh, but Jesus talked with a Samaritan woman uh, who had had five husbands and was now living with a man that she wasn't married to. Nobody else in her village would, would uh, value her because of the lifestyle she was living. But Jesus valued her enough to, to go and sit with her and talk religion with her. And she became a missionary to her village. And she joyously spread the good news that Jesus was the Messiah. The Pharisees saw a woman who had been taken in adultery. And they thought, well, here is a sinner and a homewrecker and somebody who needs to die. But Jesus looked at her and he saw a woman who was scared and humiliated, who desperately wanted a second chance to do the right thing. And he gave her a second chance and said, go and sin no more. When Jesus was called out for hanging out with sinners, he said, it's not the healthy that need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. And Jesus told them, the parable of the one lost sheep. And he said, if you have a hundred sheep and you lose one of them, don't you leave the 99 in the open country and go looking for that one lost sheep until you find it? And then you put it on your shoulders and you carry it home and you rejoice that the one that was lost is now found. And he said to the people, in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who do not need to repent. You know, Jesus values you. And Jesus values your church family. But Jesus also values those that the world has given up on. He loves them enough that he died for them Two. Who lives in your town or your neighborhood that the world has given up on, that the world looks at as trash, but that God views as treasure? What precious sheep is God searching for in your neighborhood? You know, the world sees a dirty, smelly, homeless man living under a bridge. And God sees his precious child, uh, a veteran who 
experienced such horrible things during his time in the service that he has PTSD and he struggles to hold down a regular job. The world sees an unwed teenager who made poor choices and doesn't deserve help and just needs to live with her bad decision. But God sees a frightened girl who made a mistake but chooses to give her baby life rather than abort it. She's struggling to do the right thing and would love some encouragement. The church sees a backsliding heathen uh, who hasn't come to church since she was a kid. God sees a person that loves him, that reads her Bible, that uh, prays, that generously gives to people who are in need, but who gets physically ill if she tries to enter a church building because of the memory of the abuse that she endured at the hands of a good Christian man. A man sees a woman who deserves to be beaten because she made him angry, and he views her as a punching bag to take his anger out on. But God sees his precious daughter, who would be a strong defender of other women, that, that helper, that strong defender that he's created women to be, if only somebody could help her escape the situation she's in. The world sees a prostitute, but God sees a 15-year-old who was desperate for love and affection and thought she had found it until her boyfriend turned out to be a human trafficker who sold her body to other men. God sees a victim to be rescued. The world sees a drug addict or an alcoholic, and God sees a person who desperately wants to be clean and free but doesn't know how to break that cycle of addiction. God sees his precious child broken and trapped. Who lives in your neighborhood or your town that has been treated as disposable, who has been treated as an unimportant person, but is in reality that lost sheep that God wants to rescue, that treasure that God values because he sees the good that others can't see? He sees their heart. Where is God calling you or your church to reach out to people that the world treats as trash, but God loves enough that he sent his only son to die for them? Maybe you don't know what you could do. Pray that God would show you something. And it doesn't have to be something complicated, but it needs to be some way of showing people that have been devalued that God does indeed value them, and he wants a good, abundant life for them. He wants their circumstances to be different. Maybe it's volunteering at a homeless shelter. Maybe it is uh, donating to a ministry that helps uh, mothers in poverty provide diapers and formula for their children. Maybe it is treating that person who has been hurt in the church like they're still a part of God's family, even though they don't come to the building. Maybe it's launching a recovery ministry for the addicted. Maybe it's something as simple as talking to people like they are valued by God. What if the 99 sheep went with Jesus to look for that one that was lost? What kind of difference would it make if we helped God seek out those people who are struggling, those people who have wandered down the wrong path, and we brought them back to Jesus? What kind of difference would it make for that lost sheep? But what kind of difference would it make for our churches 
and ourselves and what kind of difference would it make in our world challenge you today to pray and ask God where he has someone that you can be kind to, that you can love on, that you can help. Um, help them to know that they are valued by God and that God cares about their situation. Let us pray. God, we are so thankful that you, when you look at us, when you look at your children, you don't just see the flaws. You don't just see the mistakes. But you see what could be there. You see the good that is in us. You see that beautiful future that you have planned for us. And God, we pray that you would help us to be wise and not foolish, but God, to see in others what you see. God, we pray that you would help us to help those who genuinely want to make changes and to draw closer to you. God, we pray that you would give us a spirit of compassion like Jesus had. God, help us to see others the way that you see them. In Jesus' name, amen. I thank you for joining me for this spiritual growth retreat, and I'm hoping and praying that we will get to do this in person again someday soon. God bless.